Hello, hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee. I hope you're ready for some tea because today we're spilling the top 10 dirty secrets from the Byzantine Empire. First up, let's talk about eggplant babies. So, the Byzantines. Like most of the ancient empires, they were passionate lovers of the color purple, making it the imperial color. Only the royal family could wear certain shades of purple, and the emperor even built a special room with walls made of a precious purple stone called porphyry. It comes from only one source, a single mountain in Egypt. Thus, the eggplant baby. Imperial children born in this room were of extreme prestige, even given a special name that I can't even try to pronounce, but translates to purple born in English. It's like these babies were made of diamond, or well, porphy, and with how cultivated and special they were. They weren't even allowed to marry outside of the empire, and they also weren't allowed to marry those who weren't purple born. However, an exception was once made for Vladimir of Kiev, who shot back this request as a spicy price when asked for his military aid and that he convert to Christianity. Give up my religion? Give me a fancy wife. The purple born were like the Nepo babies of the time, attracted great loyalty and lots of favor and attention from the common people. Constantine the fourth was overthrown as a kid, but his purple born status protected him and he was allowed to remain co-emperor for 24 years. Another example is when Basil II died, the only remaining purple born were the sisters Zoe and Theodora. The citizens of Constantinople rioted at every attempt to remove them from power, cause like they're girls, sure, but the pair dominated the empire until the Theodora's death in 1056 because nobody could finally kill him. That leads us to dirty secrets number two, Miss Theodora Machiavelli. Not her actual name, but it should be. Despite a huge amount of history written about this period, Theodora got the snuff, only really documented in Procopius's secret history, which was written not long after her death in 548, but not published until the 17th century. Imagine your glory finally being documented, but only after you die, and they refer to you as Theodora. Dora from the brothel. And air out your dirty laundry, telling stories of her time as a performer, recreating Leda and the Swan, allowing geese to peck grain from her lower torso, and her saying she regrets God only gave her three spots for pleasure. Ugh, girl. But then again, Procopius goes on to describe her husband, the Emperor Justinian, as a headless demon, so we can assume not everything he wrote was devout to accurate truth. After being a burlesque star at the Hippodrome, Theo walks away at age 18 to become a mistress to a governor. But it doesn't work out and she packs up and travels to an aesthetic community near Alexandria. She hangs out there, adopts a real specific type of Christianity, then travels to Anacoc and works with Macedonia, a woman a little older than her who was a dancer but also a spy. After playing sapphic spies for a little bit, she returns to the capital, meets Justinian, and then they marry despite his pissy aunt Ephemia. When Justin dies and Justinian becomes emperor in 527, Theodore from the brothel was empress of Rome. Suck it, Procopius. The classic rap to riches story is made better by Theodora's achievements and power. As empress, she cracked down on big daddies, attempting to stop them from making money off of the working girls. These women were also barred from marriage, so she sets up residences for them to be safe. She worked on dowry rights, laws to protect women from being taken against their will, and she banished brothels. All of which makes Theodora sound like an early feminist, but she was still involved in her fair share of poisoning killings and forced marriage. But I'd be remiss not to tell this banger of a story, Theodora versus the sport fan hooligans. It nearly brought an empire to its knees. Genuinely, without Theodora, this would have been a very different outcome. Just as modern sport franchises have their diehard fans, Bazatine Chariot Racing had the Blues and the Greens, a pair of fanatical and violent fan clubs named for the colors worn by their favorite teams. Not very creative. Emperor himself, Justinian, was a well-known partisan of the Blues, and the Greens were a party of the plebs, the people. These ancient hooligans were sworn enemies, the rich versus the poor. But in 532, discontent over taxation and the attempt to execute two of their leaders saw them band together in a bloody insurrection known as the Nika Riots. While the city burned, Justinian holed up in the imperial palace. A day passed and the rioting didn't stop. Then another day passed, still no sign of stopping. For several days, the blues and the greens ran amok through Constantinople, so the emperor and his men considered packing up and fleeing. Theodore says, what the hell are you doing, man? And gave them a rousing speech on how they are being little B words and that he should die an emperor rather than give up and that she would rather die an empress than live a commoner. Straight shamed the man into fighting. Bolstered by her words and hearing her advice on what to do, Justinian had his guards block the exits to the city and ambushed it. By the time the battle ended and the riot was crushed, an estimated 30,000 people were dead, as much as 10% of the city Constantinople's entire population. Justinian's power is once again secured and as an extra screw you, he reappointed the tax. Speaking of civil wars, the Byzantines had a lot or 
or were they just bad friendship breakups? In the 9th century, Michael I was forced to resign by a trio of his generals, Leo the Armenian, Michael the Morian, and Thomas the Slav. Leo became the emperor, but he fell out with Michael. He was sus of his former friend and had him imprisoned on treason charges. Michael was sentenced to death, supposed to be tossed in the furnace alive the next night, but the next day, the Amorian's followers infiltrated the Christmas service and hacked Leo to death. So then Thomas the Slav rose in revolt against Michael, sparking a massive civil war which didn't end until 823 and badly weakened the empire against the Arabs onslaught later to come. Similar problems arose in the 10th century when Bardas Phokas rebellion was put down by the general Bardas Scaloras. When the eunuch Basil Leprechpinus schemed against Scaloras, he had his own revolt in self defense. Lecapinus countered by releasing Phokas from prison and putting him in command against Scarlos. Phokas defeated Scarlos in a single battle combat and destroyed his forces. But Phokas, Scarlos, and Lepakinos then teamed up against the young Basil. Typically, they soon fell into infighting against each other, and then Basil successfully secured power. He later became famous for blinding thousands of prisoners and sending them back to Bulgaria, where the Tsar Samuel promptly died of horror when he saw them. So, yeah, rich, powerful dudes have their friendships fall apart here, and really everyone gets affected. This isn't so much the Byzantines' dirty secret, but maybe Scotland's. It's the bagpipe inventors. There's no denying that bagpipes are profoundly Scottish in association in the modern world, but there's evidence that the Byzantine Empire invented them first in the region that's now Persia. The director for the Center of Byzantine Research in Oxford explains this is easily distinguished considering Persia's long datable legacy and longer recorded history of being more closely linked with music from the shepherding world. Its long history of shepherding is a good point of this, as bagpipes have always been an instrument of shepherds, and that the Middle East is actually the origin for most instruments that became popular throughout Europe for shepherding, like the lute and the guitar. Guess they were the trendsetters of shepherdhood. And so the bagpipe is familiar to all societies that look after livestock, and its purpose being that is how bagpipes ended up spreading from the Middle East through Europe, even going as far as China. Bagpipes remained embedded in Middle Eastern culture long term and only started losing cultural traction when they started to lose their origin by becoming synthetic materials and pieces. It messed up the culture of the music. That doesn't mean they're 100% gone, however, but yeah, pretty cool little tidbit to learn. Now, back to weird stuff and stories. Like stealing the silky secret. Prior to the 6th century, if you were interested in getting anything made of silk in the world, you were going to China to get it, and you were paying the price and the waiting time. Nobody was special enough to get bumped to the top of that list, well, except the Chinese emperors, of course, score for them. It's hard to conceptualize just how important and valuable silk was back in the day by today's standards, but the fact was that the one major trade road across the world was known as the Silk Road, so that ought to give you some sign as how highly prized the commodity was. Also think about it, as much of our material is processed nowadays, this was real silkworm silk strands being collected oh so carefully and practically by magic spooled together. This was an insanely serious craftsmanship all done without machine. Keeping the Silk Road open was a constant struggle, especially since it traveled through Persia, and Persia wasn't allowed to trade during times of war. In the 6th century, Byzantine Emperor Justinian became frustrated with the inconsistent silk trade and came up with a solution. Theft! Hooray! Under his instruction, two monks went to China to nab some of the prized silkworm eggs, which they smuggled back to the empire hidden in their canes. China wouldn't sell them any, so he was going to do it this way. And at BTW, before the monks went to China, no one even knew where silk came from. The Byzantines actually thought it came from India. The entire journey took the monks two years, but it also paid off. When they started silk factories in Constantinople and in other cities through the empire, they toppled the Chinese and Persian silk monopolies. And then the Byzantine Empire started their own across Europe. This was the cornerstone of the entire economy for well over half a millennium. And how about a forgery that formed Europe, but also allowed them to really colonize and decimate the rest of the world as well? Donation of Constantine. A major historical impact, it was documented recording a generous gift from the Byzantine Empire's founder, Constantine the Great, transferring authority over Rome and the entire Western Roman Empire to Pope Sylvester I and his successors. That already sounds forged. Let me sign my entire empire over to a stranger. It's like those true crime episodes where this suddenly killed person weirdly had signed their whole family out of a million dollar will and leaves everything to like an 18 year old co-worker Jake who has zero relation. Makes it obvious someone needs to be investigated. Especially because this was like a million dollar will. The donation was big enough to elevate popes from mere priests to religious leaders. In reality the donation was forged in the 8th century by some unknown monks, hundreds of years after both Constantine the Great and Sylvester I died. The forgery had little impact when made, but centuries 
centuries later during a period of political upheavals in medieval Europe, it was conveniently pulled out, dusted off by Pope Leo VI, who cited it as evidence to assert his authority over secular rulers and their laws. Surprisingly, this was widely accepted as authentic and almost nobody questioned its legitimacy because everyone was taught not to question religion. So popes and priests got to run rampant and do what they wanted, thus starting the corruption of the churches. The donation of Constantine's authenticity was finally challenged during the Renaissance and it quickly became clear that the text couldn't have not been dated to the days of Constantine the Great. Without this forgery, the church wouldn't have been given the unauthorized power it was granted and the history would have been unimaginably different for many people. Believing your new girlfriend over your kid may push some people to a boiling point. While Crispus was still in his teens, his father Constantine the Great appointed him commander in Gaul. Good old Crispy delivered, bringing home the gold for victories in 318, 320, and 323 that secured the province and the Germanic frontier. He also played a key role in a subsequent battle that secured his father's triumph over Licinius. Things were going great for Crispus until 326. His stepmother, Flavia Maxima Fosta, a bad name, was eager to remove him since he was an obstacle to her own son's succession to the throne, who were also in no position to don the purple anyways, the oldest being 10 years old. So her idea is to essentially throw herself at him, but he's like, ew, what the hell, you're married to my dad, and runs away. Should have ran right to his dad and told, but he didn't. Flavia did though, and falsely accused Crispus of having tried to take her by force. An enraged Constantine has his own son executed by hanging. A few months later though, Constantine discovers how his wife had manipulated him into killing Crispus and has her executed by tossing her into boiling water alive. So that's where the pun comes from. He then issued a damnitio memori, aka condemnation of memory, to erase her from official accounts, a form of dishonor issued against traitors or those who brought discredit to the Roman state. Obviously didn't work enough because I just told you guys that story. How the blame game led to logo hatred, icoclanism. What the hell is that? So it starts with the Christian panic. Islam had stormed out of nowhere to sweep the Byzantines out of the Middle East and Africa and pound their empire into Baba Ganush. So many assumed that they were being punished for their sins because this felt like punishment and sinners are punished in the Bible, so makes sense. But what was the sin then? Well, blame started getting pinned on everything, but the one that stuck was Christians violating the second commandment, the one about graven images. Churches were full of religious paintings, leading Christians, so the argument went, to worship idols. Gas. Why, how was making offerings to saints or revering their images different from worshiping Bilal? The line of reasoning led to a backlash against icons known as as iconoclasm, and that knocked off decades of religious turmoil. Icon's opponents, known as iconoclasts, had reasoned that Muslims had been successful because they strictly obeyed the Second Commandment, prohibitation of graven images. So, like props to them, they won for having a better mentality. Constantine the Third went about smashing icons as enthusiastically as his father Leo the Asanian had done. His daughter-in-law, however, Irene of Athens, bides her time through the emperor's deaths and her son's anointment until she can undo iconoclasm, even if it did mean overthrowing her son and having his eyes gouged out in the same room he was born in. So hardcore he dies from it. And why disfigure her son? Because in the Byzantine it was disfigured to disqualify. The Byzantines believed that disfigurement disqualified candidates for the throne. As a result, emperors often mutilated their rivals, siblings, uncles, kids, rather than killing them outright. You still love your family and friends after all, you just don't want to trust them. Blinding was most popular, as was cutting off noses and tongues. In later years, snipping the boys gets tossed in and becomes the most common practice. Practice. In some ways, mutilation was considered kinder than execution. John III Lascarius lived for 40 years after being blinded. Irene's kid lived for like two minutes. So mutilation never equated to death. Basil Lepicros was castrated as a boy to prevent him from causing trouble when he grew up. With the throne close to him, Basil became a powerful courtier and ruled through a series of puppet emperors instead. John Athelikos tried to overthrow his father and the emperor Heracleus in year 637. It didn't go very well for him. He had his nose and hands amputated. But then there's the terrifying Justinian II, who was first overthrown in 695 AD. The rebels cut off his nose, slit his tongue down the middle, and exiled him. He survives, escapes to the Khazars, goes to Bulgaria on a fishing boat, and forms an alliance, returns to Constantinople with an army through the sewers, and then sieged the city and took it back. Then he rules for another six years wearing a golden nose and using an interpreter to translate his gurgle talking. So yeah, does not mean it works. All right, all right. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoy. Be sure to like or subscribe to see more of our content. Until next time, comment down below what secret surprised you the most.